Shall we pray? Father, this morning, even as we are here, the entrance of your word bringeth light. Your words are life and truth to those who receive it. Your word says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Your word does so many mysterious works. It brings light, it heals, it delivers, it cleanses, it purges, it breaks down, it builds up. O oh, Father, your word has no limit to what it can do. So this morning, I pray and I release your word that you are about to speak. Let your word do its work in each one of us. You know what each one of us need. Only you know. The shepherd of our soul, only you know. Do your work in your house, O God. Do your work. So that on that day when Christ is revealed, you may glory at the finished work. Thank you, Father. Spirit of God, touch us. Our hearts, our ears. Let unbelief go and faith arise. For your word also says, the word of God has power to work in those who believe. Speak, O oh Father. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. We go to Psalm 23 last week. We were looking at Psalm 23. Just got very few verses. Almost everybody who's been a Christian believer for at least a few years or less than that knows it by heart. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Honestly, how simple it would be if it was just like this, right? <laughs> Let's go back to the first verse and the second verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay? This is the statement. The rest is what happens. Now this statement, strictly speaking, in the context of what is being read, is true only for David. You cannot take another man's life experience and say, the Lord is my... He is not saying the Lord is our shepherd. He is saying the Lord is my shepherd. The truth is, each one of us have to come to that experience where we can truly say, the Lord is my shepherd and I do not lack. You cannot just say, I do not lack. If you don't lack certain things in your life, that doesn't also necessarily mean the Lord is your shepherd. There are certain lacks in our life, we may not be even aware of it that we lack. A man who is not in the kingdom of God has no knowledge of the lack in his life. But he may be pretty well in the world. So scripture says here, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. How did he reach this state? The question is, how do we reach that state when confidently out of an experience or a series of experiences, we have come now to a living experience where you and I can actually say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's not that you are saying, I do not want. 
or I did not want. It's an experience saying, I know him now too well that I will never want. I will never face lack in my life again. When Moses asked God, when God said, go to Egypt and bring my people out, he asked, who should I say sent me? No, it's a natural question. No, what's your name? God keeps on asking people, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? So one man turns around and asks, what's your name? And God says, it's a very difficult thing to pin you, me down with a name. Because names mean certain things. Names also mean you have a beginning and you have an end. May name also means you're pinned down to a particular geographical point. So when there are people with different names, then you have to call them James the Elder, James the Younger, in the Bible too. James the Just, James the Unjust. Hmm? But how do you pin God down with a name? So he says, I am that I am. I am that I am. And one of the names which we have of God is Jehovah or Yahweh. And then along with it comes, connected with that comes a lot of titles. Each of those attributes of God has to become an experience. You cannot say, the Lord is my healer. Has he ever healed you? Can you truly, truly say God is my healer? That's my issue with pastors who says, I will never fall ill, I have never fallen ill. And what will you preach to your congregation who is sick? You can only preach from your head, right? You cannot preach from your heart saying, I have experienced him. I'm not saying you should fall ill all the time because to, so that your congregation gets healed. No. But you need to, you need to experience God also has a healer, right? In 49 years I've been in hospital only twice. Twice. Only twice. Because I believe in this. That you can walk in your healing. Second time I didn't want to go, but around the world they said, you need to go. I said, I'm not going. They said, no, you need to go because you need to experience something which you haven't experienced before. First time it was an accident. I went through the accident in a coma. I opened my eyes. I was healed. Instantaneously I was healed. Because I opened my eyes, looked. I had reached a hospital I didn't know. And the first thing written, my eyes fell is Jesus heals. I was in ICCU bed number one. In a hospital in Calcutta, I had never known that existed. And I looked and I was healed. And I walked out. Second time was this year. Okay? But both times, I know that he healed. Because post-operation, by within two hours, I was walking. The third time in my life was an accident where I ran with my son who was little and I slipped and I fell. And I knew God was there because I was carrying him in my right hand. I slipped, fell bad. In one second, I shifted him onto my left hand, fell on my right, broke my arm here, hand rather here, fracture. And then the cast was put. You have to hold your hand like this for four weeks or five, I forgot. And the cast was removed and I had to travel the next two days later. And the doctor said, you will take your time. You have to do your stretching exercises, right? Before your hand will really straighten out. But you have to travel, and you have to travel all the way to Assam and back. And I said, Lord, you can do it. And I was watching TV, and suddenly a preacher looked at me through the TV and said, there is a man who had a fracture, and his cast has been just removed, and the Lord is saying, stretch your hand. And I stretched my hand, and it stretched out. Okay, so now God is a healer. Is it theory? No longer. He say, experience. Now don't go break your hand to experience it. That is testing the Lord. It should be accidents. Okay, don't test the Lord thy God. Okay? What I'm saying is, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, many, 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 many titles are there. Basically God is giving Moses a blank check for Israel saying, my name is Jehovah. Fill it. Experience me as whatever your lack is. 
experience me. That's what I am. If it's peace you want, that's what I am. If it's fear you face, I am the captain of your horse. Everything you need to experience. David to tell Goliath, you come against me with spear, javelin, sword, but I come against you in the name of Jehovah Shavuot, which means the captain of the horse. Why did he say that? Why didn't Saul say that? Why didn't any soldier in the Israelite army have the courage to say that? I don't have to worry. Doesn't matter how tall he is. I can fight and defeat him because Jehovah Shavuot is there. For all of them knew Jehovah Shavuot has theory. But they had never experienced him. David experienced him. And that's what he's telling. One day a lion came. I was a shepherd. A little boy taking care of my father's sheep. And he took a lamb. Another time a bear came. You know what? I trusted my God and went after it and experienced Jehovah Shabbat. I know him. And I know my God very well that if he can help me to kill a lion for a lamb, he will also help me to kill Goliath for his sheep Israel. I know him. That's where his courage came. His courage did not come from knowing the word of God in his head. His courage and boldness came from knowing God as an experienced person. That's to what we need to go. That's what David is talking about. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. No. We have to experience God. So you know where the key lies? The key lies in this. Before everything else can be truly experienced of God and we know Him as a living God. Our God is a living God. This is where the problem comes. Where does He begin? He begins with verse 2. This is where God's work begins in my life. He makes me to lie down. This is a very difficult thing for man. Honestly, for the rest of the universe created, expanding unbelievably huge universe, it's easy for God, except with man. Are you getting the picture? Because to man, he's given the free will. All of us, I told you last Sunday, all of us who are parents, who are parents, who had our children, like the little one today, John David, you want them, John David is still not walk. Let them start walking and you want to make them lie down. It's very difficult. When Joshua wants to play, or Abigail wants to play, try to make them to lie down. You need to go somewhere. You want to put the baby to sleep so you can leave. They don't want to sleep. This making me to lie down is a very difficult process. He wants to make me to lie down. The problem is I don't want to lie down. He says, if you don't lie down, I cannot lead you. Now, we don't see that way. That's not the way. Our way is this. Lord, lead me, lead me, lead me, lead me, lead me, lead me. And then when I am tired out, please help me to lie down. God says, that's not the way it works in the kingdom. First, lie down. Right? Is that the way it works in the kingdom? No. It works only this way in the kingdom. Most of our issues as Christians who have got into the kingdom is that we are trying to lie down after walking. God says you cannot. You have to lie down first. First day God created, second day God created, third day He created, fourth day He created, fifth day He created, sixth day He created, at the end of the sixth day He created man. Creation over. He didn't create man anywhere in the beginning. He created man at the end. And the next day, which is called the seventh day, don't put a label on it because nobody knows which day of the week is the seventh day. There was no Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Saturday then. Okay? There were only seven days. On the seventh day, scripture says God rested. And what did he tell man? Rest. On which day? Seventh day of what? Of creation. The seventh day was man's first day. Not man's seventh day. It was the seventh day of creation. 
So if you want to put it in order, let's say, just for understanding's sake, okay? He created on Monday, he created on Tuesday, he created, finished everything on Saturday evening. Adam has been formed. Adam, go to sleep. Go to sleep. Am I on? Let's say Sunday morning, Adam opens his eyes. What does God say? Go to church. Now that's not what we want. We think Monday has the first day of the week. Let me work. And then on Sunday, let me crawl to church. I need rest. God said, I never told you that. I said, first enter into my rest first, then go work. I never asked you to work and come and rest. I asked you to rest first. Lie down. If you don't lie down, I cannot lead you. I cannot lead you. God is always there to lead us. He is always willing. And He will always lead us to still waters. He never leads His people to muddy waters. There is a stillness. It's clear. Sheep don't drink from muddy waters. Our father doesn't lead us to muddy waters and say, I don't care, drink whatever is available. He says, no, there will be peace. Every time God appears to a man, you will see one of the most common words he uses is peace. Be still. Ask ourselves, how much stillness is there in our lives? Or are we like troubled waters inside? Don't blame your circumstances. It's got nothing to do with it. The shepherd of my soul, your soul is much bigger and greater than any circumstance you are going through. And that's the testimony you heard before the service. In between the service. How he can give that stillness in your soul that he can back after a funeral at your post. Was your grief real? Yes. Was your grief also true according to the kingdom of God? In this case, yes. Why? You know, my shepherd leads me to these still waters. He leads. This is where our problem comes. Yes, we all entered into the kingdom of God. And we are on the process of becoming sheep. We did not come in. When we came, we did not come in as sheep. That's what happened. When Adam and Eve were sent out, God took those fig leaves and put garments of skin. If you had sent them out in fig leaves, they probably would have behaved like trees. So he covered them in animal garments and man still has that animal nature. Some are like snakes. Some are like dogs. Some are like cats. That's how psychology defines people under different, different temperaments. But if you look at those temperaments, those are animal temperaments. And don't, just because you have a temperament where you are quiet and you don't react, don't think you are holy. It's just another animal that is quiet. That doesn't mean anything that you have the Spirit of God in you, no. The difference between the Spirit of God that He can take a wild animal and make Him into a meek sheep. That's what the Spirit of God does. What the Spirit of God can do is then take somebody who pretends to be meek and acts as meek and say, you are a fraud. Now be real. That's what the Spirit of God does. Our struggle is that we, we are on, those, on that road of becoming sheep. And some of us, maybe over the weeks hearing this message, Need to take a good look in the spiritual mirror of the Bible and find out whether I'm really sheep or not. Study scripture. Study history. The most dangerous set of people on earth. Dangerous in the sense not that they are dangerous, but they live in danger. The greatest danger of reaching hell. Are second generation Christians. Are we getting the picture? Those whose parents were Christians. The next generation is always susceptible to fraud. Why? Because the father took you to church, the mother prayed at home, and you think you are a Christian. 
You have gone through the formalities. Even out of emotion, maybe even got baptized. But because you lived always in that reality, that reality may never be true for you. That's the danger. That's what I remember in 1936, Sadhu Sundar Singh preached in Kerala and this is what he said. He said, you Syrian Christians, he said, are like the stones in water. All around water, but the water has never got in. It is true, 2000 years of Christian history. They'll always talk about that 2000 years of Christian history. But did the water of God's word enter, penetrate your heart? That's what happened. You read the book of Judges, you read the history of Israel. Whenever a godly king or a leader died, the people went back to sin. This is the greatest danger. But to the man outside, the woman outside, who doesn't know Christ, it's very clear. I don't know and I want to know. But the second generation Christians are always living into light zone. I think, I am a Christian. Why are you a Christian? You will see they will have to go back to history. If I ask somebody who is a second generation or third generation or fourth generation or whatever, but you have a history of Christianity, if you ask them, why do you think you are a Christian? They will go back to history. They very rarely will say, the Lord is my shepherd. I know him. They don't. See, when you know Christ, you don't need history. Right? John, are you married? No. Yeah. Three weeks from now, if I ask you, are you married? Will you show me a marriage certificate or will you show me your wife? Wife. Precisely. If somebody, if somebody were to ask you, are you married? What do you go? Go home to get your marriage certificate? You say, that's my wife. And these are my children. It's an experience. I don't need history. I don't need history. It's an experience. Now this is how we cross. That is what scripture always say, says. The scripture say, examine your faith and then see, look at your works. What is the test, answer of the test? Corinthians 13.5 Look at the answer to that question. There is a question that is asked. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? That is the answer of the test. The answer of the test is not, yeah, how do you know I am in the faith? Because I go to church. Because I go for midweek meeting. That's not the answer. The answer is because Christ is in you. How do I know Christ is in me? How do I know Christ is in me? Do I know? Let's look at what he says. Right? Jesus also has something to say about all this. Turn with me to the gospel according to John. Chapter 10. And verse 14. I am the good shepherd. Read these words carefully. Okay? Both sides are important. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And am known by my own. It's one thing to say, God to say, I know my sheep. God is God. He knows everything, right? It's another thing for God to say, my sheep know me. He says, and I am known by my own. I am known. You now he's not talking there about knowledge. He's talking about experience. I am known by my own. That's when the Lord is my shepherd starts becoming slowly a reality. In verse 27, let's look at verse 4 first. 
he brings out his own sheep he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice they know his voice this is pastor who talked about he was visiting israel and he went to the countryside he saw this watering hole three shepherds brought all their flocks in to drink water they all mingled together there were around 100 sheep and then it was time to leave one shepherd just moved over there and just made a sound immediately from that his sheep separated and followed him you don't need marking you don't need uniform you don't need a tag you don't need anything they know his voice as simple that's why he said when you are saved he has put that deposit in our hearts what's that deposit his own very spirit who speaks who speaks that's why yesterday i was telling the pastors don't silence that voice don't silence that voice so he says in verse 14 i know my sheep i know my sheep and i am known by my own now this is a relative term little john david knows his mother right you try carrying him he will cry let's see him carry him he stops does that in mean he knows her name and what she did and which family is it does he know all that does he know her history does he know anything about more than the fact that this is a voice i know the knowledge of a baby of his mother is very little but it still has a knowledge why does the baby cry and when the baby is taken by the mother and held close the brother, baby stops because for 9 months in the womb he was used to one sound that was a heartbeat he recognized that it suits him one sound alone and he has heard even in the mother's womb if the father has got a booming voice or talks loudly to the womb he recognizes that voice that's all he knows but he knows that voice but it starts from there there is a voice we know and we know this is the voice of my shepherd it is not that you known him you know everything about god no man knows but god says there is a beginning you get to know and then what is the possibility verse 15 is the possibility how as the father knows me even so i know the father and i lay down my life for the sheep how can you know me as the father knows me and i know the father that is mind boggling this is the saying i know my sheep my sheep are known by me like what what is the comparison jesus he says this is the comparison you can know me if you really long and desire and willing to go the, all the way you can know as the father knows me and i know the father but how is it possible jesus how is it possible to know you he says because you know why i lay down my life for the sheep the reason i lay down my life for the sheep is so that you have this possibility that you can know me as i know the father through the blood a new and a living way by which you can come there is no stopping you can come and know me so why don't we know him what are the blocks to knowing him he says in verse 25 and 26 of the same chapter jesus answered and told them answered the, i told you and you do not believe the works that i do in my father's name they bear witness of me but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep as i said to you this is the key god says you don't believe if i have not experienced god has jehovah jira it's only because i did not believe he is my provision i may experience him in some other area i may experience him as jehovah rafa as my healer that's why some people are able to believe god for the healing but they're not able to believe god for the provision 
Because they are not able to believe God for provision, they are not able to make those sacrifices to be present in the house of God whenever there is a meeting, yet they will go 500 kilometers for a healing meeting. Are you seeing it? They are able to believe in one area, yet they are not able to believe in another area. It was on Mount Moriah, Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh. What if God had told him, go, take a three day journey, take your son with you, but don't worry, I got a ram over you, for there for you. That wouldn't have been a sacrifice, that would have been drama. He said, go, make a three day journey, and I will show you the mountain. And you go up the mountain, and offer your son. It's when he's made that three-day journey away from his house and gone up the mountain alone with his son and when he raised up his knife and God said, No, I know you fear me. And then he looks around and he says, The stone is there. The fire is there. And what did this, what was needed? The animal was needed. While going up the mountain, Isaac asked his father, Father, the wood is there. The fire is there. Where is the animal? What did Abraham speak from his head? God will provide. From his head, he said, God will provide. I believe. I believe. I believe. And he did not go back. He went up. And he continued what God had told him to do. And then on the mountain, he looked and he saw a ram. And he said, Jehovah Jireh, what I believed has come to pass. It's an experience now. It has to become an experience. God wants to bring us into those experiences. Yes, we should study the word of God. Yes, we should meditate on the word of God. Because if we don't meditate upon the word of God, there is nothing to have an experience with. Because the word of God becomes the basis for an experience. That's the reason we study the word. Because faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. So we need faith. Without faith you cannot experience. Without faith you cannot experience. So God says, you know what? I am doing these works in my father's name. And you don't believe. You don't believe. Now let us ask ourselves, do we really believe? We are being tested. The reason God allows tests into our lives is to see whether we believe. And then suddenly we realize, oh, I believe. This is where faith differs from every other religion. When it comes to Christianity, it's it's faith. It's not a religion. You are in a relationship with God. Abiding relationship. You hear His voice, you obey His voice. See, this is a sheepfold. There are no freelancers here. God says it's a sheepfold. They listen to God's voice. They listen to God's word. They listen to God's church. They dwell among the church of God, among the sheep. And they are God's sheep. That's why God says, I know them and they know me. Okay, he knows me. How do I know him? 1 John chapter 2. Witnesses for me, evidences for me to know that I know him. Chapter 2, verses 3 onwards. Now by this we know that we know him. By this we know that we know him. Why? If we keep his commandments. No, no, please don't go and start reading Leviticus. That's not what he means. Know what I mean. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve came. God was there. He spoke to them. They fellowshiped with him. But they know him? Did they really know him? No. How would they know that they know him? He gave them one commandment. Just one. Don't eat of this tree. One commandment. By this we know him if we keep his commandments. As simple as that. See, 
knowing somebody is different from saying no usually we say we know that one we know that one actually we don't know we really don't know do you really know that person how many days adam and eve fellowshiped with god in the garden we do not know but they still did not understand his nature numbers 23 19 you don't have to turn scripture says god is not a man that he should lie if they had really known he would have looked at the devil and said i beg your pardon my god doesn't lie if he said you will die you will die so they did not know him when you say yes i know yash he never breaks his word now you are talking about you know something about him which you have experienced right if somebody calls me and says pastor i want this get done in the church who whom should i say i will say that one why it's not information it is experience i know over a period of this many years you put this person in charge it will get done you know him in that area now did adam and eve know god they did not they thought god did not mean what he said and god comes back and says you got it wrong church i mean what i say when we sin and keep on sinning and say god understands it doesn't matter god says you know what you don't know me and those who preach god understands don't know him either what does he say he who says i know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him he's not saying or just sinning he said continuously unrepentantly walking in your sin struggling with your sin and wanting your deliverance is one thing i'm talking about willfully you don't care that's all we're not talking about david god is not looking at the quantum of your sin he's looking at the state of your heart what saul did and what david did there's no comparison david did worse things but you could know that he knew god and he could be corrected and put back on the road because he heard and he knew that's what god is saying he who says i know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him verse 5 but whoever keeps his word truly the love of god is perfected in him by this we know that we are in him there is a perfection that comes okay so yes when i came to the lord in 1984 the only portion in the bible i knew was from john chapter 3 that's all i knew i had read every other religious text in the world except the bible it was a blessing in disguise because when i came to the lord i had no doctrine because doctrine fights against truth sometimes so i came to john chapter 3 and that's all i knew that was in 84 two weeks later they told me share the bible study all i knew was john chapter 3 i didn't go to revelation i didn't go to genesis that's how people do they just come to the lord in two months they want to teach from revelation do you know all i knew was john chapter 3 all i taught was from john chapter 3 how what to be born again 20 now it's going to be 30 years later i'm still teaching from john chapter 3 but the teaching is different what i have known him then and what i know him from john chapter 3 today the experience has grown all i knew was john chapter 3 nothing else then as you start studying the word of god Okay God doesn't tell you when you are just newborn baby he doesn't teach you about consecration and about sacrifice he doesn't he would run if you were to teach you all those things so he takes takes you through that's called the milk of the word the first thing he told me was stop gambling in the hostel room that was very easy to understand right he really know leviticus for that when you play cards you make money or you lose money he said stop that second thing he told me is james you don't smoke 
but you sell cigarettes in your room. Stop that. Because it's an easy way to make money. Always smokers, and I'm the only one who doesn't smoke. So I'm not tempted by cigarettes, but I'm tempted by money. So sell cigarettes to make money. Easy, right? You should always sell what you're not tempted with. <laughs> Good business principle. Okay? If you love sweets, don't start a sweet shop. It won't work. Okay? The second thing God says is, stop that. So the next day when people came and knocked on the door and said, James, two cigarettes, I said, I don't have. I didn't run out of stock. Closed shop. Was it easy? It was easy. But you know what he was doing? He was testing whether I would obey his voice in the things which I knew. It was not difficult. Hmm? He didn't, you know, later I understood this is what it means to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Because to sell cigarettes you need a body. To gamble you need a body. Think what God is asking you. Look at what God is asking you. That's how you know. And if he isn't asking you something for years and years and years and years and you're not willing to obey him in that area, how are you going to go forward? I'm talking about things which you can obey. I'm not talking about things in which you need deliverance. Okay, these are two different things. So don't go into guilt if you are in bondage in another area and say, I'm not able to obey, but you cry out to the Lord, you struggle, and who says, who will deliver me? God says, I understand. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about other areas. Do you believe? Can you start with the little things? The little, little things before God can tell you the difficult things. That's why simple things they taught me in the beginning is, James, study your word. Because I had the discipline of reading over years and years and years, so nobody had to tell me, read your Bible. Only problem was they had to tell me, stop reading. So I bunked classes for two weeks, sat, locked up, and I read. Read through. It was good news. I didn't graduate to KJV and NKJV and all immediately. Go, you are saved. Okay, now take a KJV Bible. No, good news. And it sounded like good news to me. If it had been thou art and walk this thing, I would have given up. No. So, when you evangelize, don't make it difficult for people. No. That's why I keep telling you, do not invite young believers non-believers to this church because it is difficult for them to digest what comes. That you do in your little Bible studies, your office spaces, do that. And I have no issues if God shows you another church and God tells, sends, tells them, go to that church, you will grow over there, send them there. This is not about numbers. But be sure the church you send is a, it's a God-fearing, word-believing church. Because some people need to go to other churches to grow. He's just been born again and he is hearing the messages and he gets terrified. Are you? I don't want this. It's perfectly fine. We don't need, this is not about numbers. This is not about the kingdom. This is about the king. This is about sheep. He says, I have other sheep too. I have other flocks. And then finally he says, you know what? One day there will be all one flock. He knows his sheep. Whichever church they are sitting in. We don't know. And when we get very religiously proud, we will say that only we are saved. You are not. Because look at our works. God said, I beg your pardon? That too is my sheep. In some areas they hear my voice better than you. But you don't know. We are separated people. We go six times a week to the church. And we go giving transcripts everywhere. And we are there first in the church and the last to leave. God said so. That does, does that make the others not my sheep? They too are my sheep. They may be struggling sheep. They may be lambs which I carry. They may be broken which I bind. You are whole. Good for you. I love you. I love them too. 
They are my sheep. No? So understand how his kingdom works. Okay? We are not talking about false doctrines here. We are not saying every church is the church of God. No, I am not. Some churches are not the church of God. The Holy Spirit has left long time ago. And he won't come back either. I am not saying, don't misunderstand me. There are fundamental things which we believe in, which is called shared beliefs. Fundamental to salvation. You cannot compromise on those things. So when you come to the Lord and you have broken through in one area, you will be able to say in that area, you know what? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In this whole list of what Jehovah is, one you can tick. I've experienced him there. God says, don't stop with that. What you experience me here is true about me everywhere. Try me. Try me. That's what scripture is talking about. If you're comfortable in your sin, you can't be a, you can't be a sheep. You hate your sin, you're still sinning, but you hate your sin, it is fine. But if you're comfortable in your sin, you don't know me. You don't know me. That's the thing. How can the Spirit of God reside in you and you be comfortable in your sin? But what about David? I said, what about David? No, didn't he take another man's wife? Yes, he did. Didn't he have a long drawn affair with her? Yes. Didn't he kill her husband? Yes. But do you know what he said during that period? He said, my bones were wasting away. I couldn't sleep. My bones were like rotten inside. Oh, why? Why are your bones rotten? I'm consumed by guilt. I'm a miserable man. But didn't you get what you wanted? This is the woman you wanted, right? Didn't you get her? Yeah, I got her. Your marriage is legitimate right now. Yeah, it is. Then why are you miserable? Because I sinned against God. Was Saul miserable? Was he ever miserable about his sin? No. Was Cain ever miserable about his sin? God is coming. Trying to bring some conviction in that fellow. Where is your brother? He's lying over there hidden. The blood is still not dry. Where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? What can you do to that man? Does he know God? Then God punishes him. What is his response? My punishment is too much for me to bear. He's not talking about his brother at all. The brother doesn't come in in his conversation at all. If you look at the story of the prodigal son, you don't have to turn. Two brothers. You know what? The prodigal son who comes back actually understood his father better than the fellow who stayed. He's lying there in the pig pen and saying, in my father's house, in my father's house, in my father's house, in my father's house, in my father's house. The other fellow who lived with the father all the time is standing outside and saying, you are like this, you are like this, you are like this. Who knew the father? Who stayed at home? Now you understand the difference of the unbelieving Gentile who comes into the house of God is gung-ho about God and the Christian second generation, third generation, fourth generation who was born in the church and grew up in the church is not at all excited about God. The danger of religion mistaken for salvation. That's why sometimes it is good God allows His children who grew up in the church, to go out and fall. Fall and fail miserably. So that they would experience His mercy. Experience. Why do you think Israel was defeated? Or if you read the record of Israel, it seems like defeat, defeat, captivity, defeat, defeat, captivity. Why? So they would experience it. That's the only way they could experience it. 
Because the purpose of our life, we forget, is not success in the world, is to experience Him. That's why we looked at yesterday and says the only time in his entire 110 year history it is mentioned in the Bible Joseph saw successful, Joseph was successful, Joseph was successful, he didn't even get a paycheck. Now that's not what you say. If Raj comes and says, Pastor, I am successful, I got a promotion, right? Or a student comes and says, you know, Pastor, I have done better this year, I am first in the class, I am successful. Why? You have something to show, right? What has Joseph to show in Potiphar's palace? A slave is a slave. If you get to eat, you are lucky. Next place he is in the prison. What is it? A prisoner is a prisoner. A food will come if it comes. What is written in both places? The only time written in his life, Joseph was successful. And the answer given, God was with him. This is what success is. What is success? You experience me. That is what success is. You can be the CEO of your company and be called successful in the world and never have experienced God. Are you successful? This is what the world of her days told about Mary Magdalene. Mad woman, she had seven demons in her perfect bondage. What does Jesus say? She is the one to whom I revealed myself and sent the word out to the world I have risen. Who is successful? Whose testimony will you believe? Whose testimony will you believe? This is where faith differs from sight. This is where you are able to say, yes, I heard his voice. He told me. What did he say? Don't make it very complicated. He will say, don't do this. Let me ask you this question. If you're driving on the roads, if you're on a highway, you're going somewhere, what are the road signs? Speed breaker ahead. Right? Curve. Dangerous curve. Pedestrian crossing. School ahead. Aren't these all warnings? Where have you seen in a road saying smooth road ahead speed? Now you tell me, have you ever seen signboards like that? What are the signboards when God wants us to walk with Him? Be careful, be careful, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And why do we get upset with Him? He's just a father putting signboards on the road saying, Be careful, be careful, there is a deceiver, there is a deceiver, he will strip you, he will trap you, he will trip you. Go just keep walking, but don't take those turns. That's all. Because we got a negative image of police of policemen in our mind, we hate the word law. The law is good. Try to drive without laws. You will say, Lord, have mercy. That's how we know him. Again, chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, 8 and 9. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love, does not God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. This is another thing. Now let's not make it into some Holy sanctimony says, I love God. God says, let's wait there. Let's wait there. He says, we leave me aside out of this picture. Actually, he says in the same letter, he says, leave me outside of the picture. If you cannot love your brother whom you cannot see, whom you can see, don't tell me that you love me whom you don't see. He says that. Very clearly he says, if I cannot love Yash whom I can see, then he says, you are a fraud who says, Lord, I love you, I love you, I love you. He says, you don't. You simply don't. You know what it means? How do I know I am a sheep? Sheep love other sheep. Sheep love to be 
in the company of other sheep. They don't want to be with wolves. They don't want to be with dogs. They don't want to be with cats. They may say, God bless you. I will pray for you. But I love to be among sheep. Simple. Not very complicated. All of us, when we are growing up, when we went to school, in the evening we all went back home. Did we all go back home? Now tell me, why did you go home? Why did you go home? When did you go to the mall? Later you went. When you grew up, you went to the mall. But when you were small, I'm saying. Hmm? Didn't we grow up? Wasn't our mamas waiting for us? Come, honey. Didn't they carry us? And we were so excited to go home. Why? There was a place where we knew we belonged. God says this is how it works. Sheep love sheep. Honestly, these are questions you have to ask. If I don't like being in the company of believers... There's something really wrong with me. I will question my salvation. When I first went into Bhutan after being saved, there was not a single believer. Not a single believer. All I had was my Bible and three books. Those three books after my Bible were my believers. One was Watchman Nee, one was C.S. Lewis, one was Martin Lloyd-Jones. They three were my companions, all three dead. But even when they are dead, they still speak. When I went back home, after every day teaching, I went back home, I went back to these three friends I had. I had my God, I had my Bible, but I went back to those three friends. Even now those books are there. My wife is reading Martin Lloyd John's now. And I said, honey, this was what kept me during those days. My friends. Sheep. Love being in the company of sheep. Even when there are no other sheep. Do you go out to them? Yes. You love them. You minister. You teach. You you have t- good times with them. But when you come back, you always come back to the company of sheep. And you want to be in the company of sheep. And if you don't like being in the company of sheep, though they may not be perfect, though they may be all kinds of issues with them. But you know, this is where I belong. I belong here. Why? I am sheep. This is my home. The church is my home. That's what baptism means. Baptism means, I died being a dog, a cat, a wolf, a leopard, a cheetah, whatever I was in the old animal nature, and I have gone, dunked under the water, and I come up as sheep. And as soon as I came up from sheep, I am separated unto sheep. So what does scripture say in Acts chapter 2? All those who believed, 3,000 were baptized that day. And what happened? The next day onwards, they gathered daily for the apostles' doctrine, for prayer and for fellowship. Why? Because they realized they were sheep. And we need to be with sheep. But where in the Jews before that? Yes, wolves, but Jews. Now what happened to you? Are you Jews today? No. What are you? Sheep. And what do you see? Peter has fishermen? No. Shepherd. What do you see? Thomas has shepherd. What do you see? Matthew has tax collector? No. Shepherd. And what are we? Sheep. Where do you go? I go to? I go to Matthew. He's not sitting in the tax booth anymore. He's sitting there and teaching me the word, not about collecting taxes. He's shepherd, I'm sheep. I don't want to learn of him. See how life has changed? If life hasn't changed this way, people stray off and they come back. But even to stray off, you need to have to be somewhere to stray off to come back there. The shepherd is going after the sheep that was lost. From his flock. The shepherd is not going after the wolf who was there in the forest. He goes after the sheep. He knows the sheep straight. It was tempted. It was enticed and it went. The shepherd goes. He knows it was part of my sheepfold. And he went. And he carried and brought it. And put it back in the sheepfold. And says, stay there. The problem you went is you took your eyes off me. Now stay close. Stay close. Stay close. Stay close. And God says, 
Do we? Do we believe? Are these fundamental things there? Simple things. Simple. Not very difficult. Don't make it complicated. Simple tests to know whether Christ is in me. Wolves like meat. Right? Lions like meat. Leopards like meat. Bears like fish. Sheep like grass. That's why he turns them to what? Jumping fish. Is that written? He leads them to? Makes them lie down where? On green? Oh, what do sheep like? If I am sheep, I like grass. If I don't like grass, I am not sheep. As simple. It's as simple as that. When I am a young lamb, when I go and the Holy Spirit in me, however little of it is there, He leads me to good news and He leads me to the Gospels because He knows that's green for me. If I go to Leviticus, I find it is dry. God says, go back son, go back to the Gospels. That's green for you. I lead you to green pastures. Don't jump ahead of me and go to hay. Trust the shepherd. He is good. He knows you. He knows me. I tell people, don't try to walk before you learn to stand. Don't. Go. Let him lead you. And whenever he leads you, you will see it is green. Always fresh. There is nourishment in it. There is nourishment in it. Awesome nourishment when he leads. You know you received a revelation. You know that has sustained you. You know, Lord, even even for me now, after all these years when I'm preaching, when I'm preaching, suddenly I say, Lord, am I too hard? Too hard, too hard, too hard. I'm talking about pride, 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 pride. I'm talking about humility, humility, humility. Now, are people getting offended? Am I speaking a word? You know what he gave yesterday, day for yesterday? Yesterday's message, if you were there. Right? I needed that for me. More than anybody to whom I preached, I needed that confirmation for me. He said, son, do you know? 80 years old, Moses is asked, what is in your hand? What does he say? My staff. He's still holding on to it. Shoes are Zipporahs. Pants, Jethro's. Clock, Jethro's. Everything is father-in-law's. Still you are not humble. You're still holding on to your pride. What is in your hand? That is mine. I brought it from Egypt. I still have it. My pride. My staff. The last thing we'll let go. We won't let go of certain symbols of our pride. And how do you know that is a symbol of pride? Let somebody touch you, there you get upset. Let somebody touch you there. That is how he makes you without reputation. Those are the areas he will touch. What did God tell Moses? Throw it before me. I will show you what your pride is. Suddenly he saw. That's the devil. The closest image the devil has on earth is a proud man. Because he is full of pride. He said, did you see the nature of your pride? And he turned and he ran. God said, where are you running? You don't run from the devil. You run from temptation. You resist the devil. Don't run from the devil. If you run from the devil, he will run after you. Turn around and stand. Face him. And he tells him something which we don't tell anybody. Nobody with knowledge of science and animal nature will never tell you, catch a snake by the tail. That's asking for trouble. You don't catch a snake by tail. You, If you don't catch the snake in the first place, okay, knock it off. I've got good experience with snakes over my years, so I'm telling you, if you ever catch, catch it behind the neck. Or if you catch it by the tail, flip it. So his spine gets locked. Okay? But don't catch a snake otherwise. 
But what does God tell him? Catch him by the tail. That is asking for death. God is asking, son, before I can really use you to serve me, are you willing to die? If a man who is not willing to die, how can God give him life? Scripture says, he bent down and picked it. It become a rod again. But there's a hidden mystery in it. After that, he's before the Pharaoh. An old, 80-year-old man goes before the Pharaoh. It's a battle between staffs. The Pharaoh also will have his scepter. How is the scepter held? He holds it. Have you seen all of them walking? Anybody who's got some position has a scepter. Once they are retired also, they will walk. Because my area is retired army people. Every morning they will go. But if you look closely, you will see there is a difference. The emperor of the most powerful nation and a simple 80 year old man who came out of the wilderness who is going to bring that nation down. If you see, Moses is holding his staff upside down. Because God said, hold it by the tail. It's no longer a symbol of your pride. It is a symbol of your humility that you have put it before God. Then picked it when God said. What are you proud of? Put it before God. And if you say don't pick it up, don't pick it up. Leave it there. Leave it there. It's fresh. Do you know how many times I have preached on Moses' rod over the years? How many years? What all I have preached on that? How many places? Yesterday, when I went back to it, it was fresh. Because he leads you to green, green, green pastures. The pastures are green. He can take you back to the same portion. Back to the same portion. Back to the same portion. And tell you, you know what son? I will always make you rest in green pastures where you have nourishment. I am not giving you this for knowledge. I am giving you this for nourishment. Learn, learn, learn. This is for nourishment. This has to become life in you. That's the purpose of this. He led them into the wilderness and humbled them. For what? So that they would eat manna. And would learn, we would learn to eat from the word of God. But has the word of God gone into our hearts? Do we desire this? Or if I too am like an Israelite, I will say, I detest. Now you know what? We don't say that. But we show that. We don't say that. We show that. Let me ask you. Are we weekly believers? Bi-weekly believers? Or whole week believers? What is our consumption of the word? We don't say. We show. We don't say. Of course, we are very religious. We don't say stuff like the Israelites. We just show it like that. God says, do we? In the old Indian culture, when a baby is born and the baby starts crawling to show what he would probably pick in life, they used to put different, different things before him and he would crawl and pick a sword. Naturally, any baby, what she saw anything, will go pick it up and they will make him into a soldier. But it is true spiritually. When you are born of the Spirit, and the Spirit comes to you, and if you allow the Spirit, and allow the Spirit to lead you, you will see, automatically you will crawl back to this. Because the Holy Spirit has no other testimony on earth other than the Word of God. You will turn. With your hands or in your mind. You will turn. Pages will turn in your mind back to the word. Back to the word. Back to the word. Why? Because scripture says the spirit that is in you envies for you. Jealously envies. 
There is an envy, there is a jealousy that's absolutely right in God's sight. God says, I'm a jealous God. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm a jealous spirit. When? For you. And that's the things which we need to know. The problem is we can come to a point in our sheepfold and we can stop. You cannot stop growing as a sheep. It's a very dangerous phase. Because if I stop growing as a sheep, now the green grass starts irritating me. It doesn't nourish me anymore. The still waters start upsetting me. Why? Because I'm no longer interested in green grass or in still waters. What do I start doing? It I start disturbing the other sheep. Pastor, you're going off your head. Let me prove to you from scripture. Ezekiel 34. The title of that chapter is Shepherds and Sheep. Verse 17 onwards. 17 to 19. Maybe that's enough. So read the whole chapter. And as for you, O oh my flock, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep. Oh. Did we see that? I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and God. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture, that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture? Is it enough? You went to church, You heard the word. You got upset with the word. Now you're going around and telling everybody, don't go there and listen to that word. Isn't that what so many people have done? Why are you upset? Because you are treading down with your feet the residue of your pasture. You used that same grass to grow thus far and after that you were not interested. Not interested anymore, right? Now what are you going to do? You have turned against the other sheep. Now you are treading down the residue of your pasture and to have drunk of the clear waters that you must foul the residue with your feet. Did you know this is a clear connection from Psalm 23? And he says, I will judge between sheep and sheep, ram and goats. That's what you and I have to be careful about. That's the danger. I have to keep, I have to keep moving on. I have to keep moving on, moving on. Why? There are others coming in who need to feed. I don't muddy up those waters. I don't trample upon those green grass. Stay away, move away, he says. Are we getting the picture? At diff- we may be at different stages in our life, in our walk, but judge ourselves every time constantly. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? What is my response to the shepherd's voice? Because he said, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. Read that chapter, Ezekiel 34. It's about shepherd and flocks. Don't get, don't get upset. The word is true. The word is genuine. Don't get upset with the word. Just be honest and say, Lord, it really upsets me. Really, really upsets me, Lord. It's sticking in my throat. Grass is green. Grass is good, but I'm not able to swallow. He he likes honesty. He loves honesty. He knows I know it. I put it there so that it would stick in your throat. He leads us. He leads us step by step. By step, by step, as we close. I don't want to confuse you even more. I'm preaching from on the spur because I was too tired. And I asked the Lord, you need to really give me the word today. I will, I will just go behind the pulpit. You need to give me the word for your sheep. You know your sheep. I want to turn you to, to Ruth. I just want you to look at Two verses. Or actually one verse. Ruth 2 verse 14. I love that verse. You 
This is Ruth, symbol of a little broken lamb who is coming into the Lord's house. Boaz is a type of the shepherd Jesus Christ. Boaz not is a sir. It's interesting, right? What is she doing in his field? Do you know? She asked Naomi, Mommy, can I go glean? Please? She picks the most difficult work. Gleaning in Israel's history, in their culture, is only next to begging. Please understand that. Gleaning was left to people who had nothing to eat. So God said, leave some edges for them. That is, don't beg. Just go pick up those gleaning things. So that you will inculcate the habit of working hard. So that you will never have to beg. Okay? So he says, gleaning is only a substitute to begging. What does she say? Can I glean? Naomi may be broken, but she's bitter. Naomi may be been, has gone through so much trauma in her life, but she's still proud. It's interesting. You read Ruth carefully. Now, we would think, this girl, Moabite girl who has come from outside, is asking her mother-in-law, Mommy, can I go glean? And mommy will use information which you have. You are back in your own town and your closest relative, second closest relative has the largest farm. So you should tell him, okay honey, go over there. That's my cousins. If he asks, say that you are my daughter-in-law. And she, she doesn't mention at all. Pride. Think about it. Yes, she's going to let us, he's, let's say he's going to Kerala and he's going to Kollam. Yes, she says, Pastor, I'm going there, I'm just there for two days. And if I don't tell him my mother is there? Hey, yes. If you don't have a place, this is the number, call my mother, go there and I'll call her and tell her you stay. Right? She doesn't say. The Spirit of God who leads this unbelieving, little believing Gentile girl into the right field. She goes into Baha's field. You know, our shepherd cares for us. Even before we knew him. He ordained that my footsteps should lead me into his pasture. And she goes there. When a landlord comes, these are all harvests. This is the field. Harvest is taking place. At the edges, those beggars are picking. You see? What does the landlord look at? You look at, hey, are you harvesting well? Are you harvesting well? Are you harvesting well? Are you harvesting well? No. She sees her. He says, who is that girl? Who is that girl? Jesus, our shepherd, will see every meek and lowly one who walks into his house. He ignores the rest. That's why the same Jesus who was there in Boaz vineyard is the same Jewish Jesus who walked on earth and in that crowd when that poor lady touched the hem of his robe, he stopped and said, who touched me? See, Peter is saying, my Lord, everybody is touching you. He said, no. One touched me. Just one. Why? Because virtue went. Virtue went. It's interesting, right? When we touch somebody, we'll say, oh, I got a shock. Interesting. That's not what God says. He says, I got a shock. Shock went from me. When somebody who is low and meekly comes and touches me, power goes from me. Somebody touch me. We have to understand the heart of our shepherd. Think about Yash. Okay, today you are the Bakra. Okay, Yash. Yash lives in Bhavanpalli and he's got a house over there and he's very gung ho about religion. Let us say DGS comes, stays in his house. DGS is in heaven with God, I believe. And Benihin comes, stays in his house. And then next one comes, stays in his house. And then I am now a little well known evangelist and he tells, Pastor, when you come to my house, when you come to Hyderabad, stay in my house. After all, everybody stays in my house. Right? That's it. Usually when people want to talk about, they will tell who all has come and stayed in their house. Right? 
Centurion comes and says, my servant is sick. Jesus said, I will come. He says, don't come to my house. I am not worthy for you to come into my house. Jesus looked at him and said, wow. Not only do you have faith, you are meek and lowly. How many of us really tell Lord, Lord come, Lord come into my life or says, Lord, how can you come into my life? I know the mess I am. Only you can cleanse me and then come into my life. Are you getting the picture? Boaz notices. He calls her. He's very kind. He said, Sirat, you don't worry. Nobody will harm you. You came to the right field. And he tells her, come here. Eat of the bread and dip a piece of bread in the vinegar. Come. Here, eat. Stage one, right? That's what Jesus does. First thing he does is, here, partake of my body and of my blood. Partake. That's how your life comes. And then she sat beside the reapers. Who are the reapers? Oh. Boaz comes to his field and he says, Peace be upon you. And all the reapers says, The God bless you. Who are the reapers? Reapers are the workers in God's vineyard. Jesus comes and first blesses his shepherds. Then the shepherds bless him back. And then only they have a blessing to give the people. And this lamb sits beside the reapers. He's very careful. Let me sit close to them. What does Boaz do? He parts parched grain. Stop. Joshua chapter 5 verse 11. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. What is this? Where is this? In the promised land. What stopped? What stopped? Oh, you don't know your Bible. Manna stopped. Manna is for the wilderness. The milk of the word is for the wilderness. The meat of the word is when you start inheriting the promise, the life of Christ. They start eating past grain. When Boaz, who gave her bread and wine, saw her sitting near the reapers, he gave her past grain and said, You are ready for meat. You are ready for meat. You are ready to enter into the deeper life of God. He watches. He watches. He watches us. He watches every move of ours. And he is a shepherd who tenderly wants to feed his flock. He knows when you are alone in your room, whether you are going after past to eat or grain, what is your hunger for. He knows. He knows. You may think you are alone. You and I are never alone. Because the one who promised that I would never leave you nor forsake you. He says, she ate and was satisfied. Isn't that awesome? That she ate this and was not satisfied. She ate this and was satisfied. Are you satisfied with wine and Bread alone? No, Lord. I want the fullness of Christ. I want everything that you can offer me. Then only my soul will be satisfied, O Lord. I ate manna in the wilderness, but now I am in the land of my inheritance. I want parched grain. That's the produce of the land. That is my inheritance, the very life of Christ. Church, move on with God. He has so much to give us. So much, so much, so much to give us. As we close, let us go back to that line again. He makes me lie down in green pastures. It's not singular, it's plural. Many, 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 many pastures. Many, many. One after another, one after another, all through eternity, experience after experience after experience after experience of God. Experience after God. Green. It's all green. There's not a single dry pasture where he will make you lie down. No, he will not. 
Once Abraham knew Jehovah has Jaira, he was at rest in that area. He will never even worry about in that area. My wife will ask me, honey, do you have money? I will tell honey, I will always have money. It's got nothing to do with my bank account or my income. It's got to do with an experience. When I experienced him 15 years ago, and I know never, ever will I never want in my life. There is no fear about giving. Why? That pasture is absolutely green for me. It's always green. Fresh, living experience. What about other experiences? God says, I want you to lead to this, to this, to this, to this, to this, so that when you finish, you are an overcomer. You experience me to the fullness I have reserved for you on earth. Run to that. Keep moving. Keep moving. But those who are weak, those who are struggling, the little lambs, don't crush them. Don't trample upon them. Because he loves them. He cares for them. They too are the sheep of his flock. Don't muddy the waters. Don't trample upon the green pastures. Don't do that. Don't do that. Leave it. Move aside. Let them also come and drink. Even if you are no longer thirsty for those waters, move away. Let them drink. Let them eat. They need it. Maybe you don't need it anymore. Never make the mistake of trampling upon the pasture or mudding up still waters. Don't do it. Because our God cares. He cares. And He cares for us. A long time ago, there is a story told in various forms. I've told it here many times. Where there was this recital by this screen theater star. He recited Psalm 23. Trained voice. No? Peter can train you in singing. No? Training how to articulate. And he recited Psalm 23. Oh, the whole lot stood up and they applauded. Then an old man came and recited Psalm 23. By the time he finished reciting Psalm 23, tears were flowing through everybody's eyes. The first man came back and said, I knew the shepherd Psalm. He knew the shepherd of the Psalm. That's the difference. That's the difference. It is not enough church, it's a close, to know the word of God. You need to know the God of this word. That's important. It's not enough to know the word of God. There are millions out there who know the word of God. But I and you need to know the God of this word. The God of this word. He is the one who will sustain you. And he will keep you. And he will always make you lie down in green pastures. And lead beside the still waters. Shall we pray? Shall we stand? Oh Father, I just thank you. I just praise you. I just worship you. As your child prayed in the morning. Thank you for leading us through those valleys. For it is in those valleys we experienced you. We experienced you as who you really are. Our prayer is God. We experience the word of God. And know, keep on knowing the God of this word. I pray Lord you will lift up feeble hands and strengthen weak knees. Some are struggling. Some are straying. Some are stuck. Some are moving. But Father, you know, they are all your sheep. And you love them all. And you lay down your life for us all. I pray you lift up the weak ones. Bind the wounded ones. Break the bondage of those who are stuck. And remove the obstacles of those who are floundering. O oh, shepherd, only you see in the spiritual realm. 
what stops each one. For the day and the hour is coming when each one standing here in your house today will have to know your voice one to one. They will have to know. And I pray, Father, each one will learn to listen to your voice, obey your voice, and you will take us always to those green pastures and lead us to still waters. Thank you, Father. As we go, may your presence go with each one. Keep us. Keep us, Lord. Keep us. We have the tendency to stray. Keep us under the shadow of thy wings of all. Father, I pray, keep us. Keep us. You keep us under that shadow of thy wings. Keep us, Lord. Let no one stray. Thank you, Father. I speak your blessings into each one's life. May the blessings of the living God, the power of God, the presence of God go before each one. Let each one have rest. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us. Amen.